So what I would like to cover in the first session is a bit of background and history of the survey um, and sort of the methodology um, of, of the survey to core things you need to know about the questionnaire, the sampling, imputation and the data collection. Um, and obviously some things have changed now with the start of the pandemic, so I'd like to give you a bit of an overview of um, how we responded to uh, to the pan uh, pandemic and what's changed since. Um, so what is the Labour Force Survey? It's a, it's a survey of employment circumstances of the UK population. Uh, before the pandemic was probably the largest, now it's probably more one of the largest continuous household survey in the UK, con considering that we've also got the COVID infection study going on at the moment. Um, and uh, it's got over a thousand variables, um, including questions from the questionnaire, uh, so questionnaire variables as well as derived variables for analysis. And the topics it covers is uh, general household characteristics, job and industries and occupation, employment patterns, hours worked, earnings and benefits, health, well-being and sickness, and education and training. Um, the overall sample design uh, covers uh, people living in private households as well as nurses living in uh, NHS accommodation. We also cover students, but not in halls of residence. They're basically covered uh, at their parents' address. The sampling frame we use is the postcode address file, uh, as well as um, an NHS accommodation sampling frame that was uh, specifically produced for this survey. We also use the telephone directory to match telephone numbers to addresses that uh, are based north of the Caledonian Canal. Um, I'll explain later why that is. And um, other communal establishments are, however, excluded from the sample. The sample is a random sample stratified by postcode and is representative of uh, the UK population um, with a few exceptions and that's basically because we only uh, include uh, the NHS accommodation as a communal establishment. Um, so the LFS sample um, covers around 75,000 issued um, addresses and uh, around 40,000 households take part uh, every quarter and this equals around 90,000 individuals. Um, so when we look at the um, overall population in the UK, each respondent represents about 800 people. Now obviously that differs based on their characteristics. So there's certain um, sample members like uh, people living in 75 plus households that have larger weights than others because we don't interview them at every wave. Um, and also an important thing to mention is that the LFS is not of sufficient size to allow analysis uh, below regional level. Um, and this is where the annual population survey comes in, which I'm going to mention in a minute. Um, also an important thing to note is that the Labour Force survey is um, a longitudinal survey where we follow addresses over the course of five waves in three monthly intervals. So we replenish 20% of the sample every quarter. And this depicts the uh, wave structure here on this slide. So in any given quarter, let's take the first one, January to March 2020, you have um, a cohort of respondents um, that is uh, in wave one, one in wave two, wave three, etc. So a cohort from each wave that makes up the LFS uh, data set uh, on a quarterly basis. Uh, the annual population survey sample serves the purpose of conducting analysis at local authority level. Um, so the boost cases basically ensure that uh, we have a set number of cases at, at local level. And um, we cover around 200,000 households or we contact around 200,000 households and around 140 of those take part and that equates to around 280 individuals. So what is the connection between the two surveys? Uh, so these are not two standalone surveys, they're actually connected. Um, and in the way that part of the labour force survey is used in the annual population survey. So the annual population survey is basically made up of uh, part of the labour force survey as well as the labour force survey boost. Um, and this here depicts the uh, wave structure of the boost. 
Um, this means that respondents of the boost are contacted um, in four waves in 12 monthly intervals. So we replenish 25% of the sample every quarter. So in any given year, so let's take the first one here in 2017, you have uh, a cohort from each wave similar to the LFS. Looking at the APS, so as I said, that combines the LFS, specifically wave one and wave five cohorts in any given year, plus all waves of the uh, boost cases. And that together basically gives you a bigger sample um, for the annual population survey to conduct analysis at lower level. Moving on to imputation, there's two imputation methods we apply uh, on the um, on both surveys. The rolled forward imputation is basically used as a successful um, where, where a successful interview happened at one wave, um, but then there was a non-response at the next wave. And you can identify this um, with the variable I outcome and where this equals six, you know that there was a rolled forward imputation and that's used on the LFS person and household microdata. Um, rolled forward imputation, however, only occurs once. So where someone has been a non-respondent in two consecutive waves, we don't roll the data forward into another wave. Uh, donor imputation is basically used um, where there's been a non-response at wave one or there were there was a second consecutive wave of non-response. So this is where then um, a case with similar characteristics um, is, is used uh, for donor information. Uh, Non-responders can be uh, identified as an out, um, I outcome equals three, and uh, you can find those on the LFS and APS household microdata. <clears throat> so that this this part of this uh, kind of imputation happens on the LFS and APS. Um, then over to the data collection. So pre-pandemic, our approach was that we did face-to-face -face interviews at wave one and then followed up with telephone interviews at wave two. The exception was cases north of the Caledonian Canal. They were already interviewed over the phone from wave one onwards um, for um, efficiency reason, really, because it was easier to contact them um, over the phone. Uh, we've got approximately 600 field interviews and 200 telephone interviewers to um, do the field work on, on the two surveys. And uh, we allow proxy responses uh, on this survey and around a third um, of the data is collected that way. The field process um, looks um, like it covers basically five stages. Uh, the sample is drawn on a quarterly basis, about three months in advance. Uh, sample addresses then get divided into th 13 weekly stints. Uh, stints is basically um, sort of interview areas and they're allocated to interviewers across Great Britain. And NISRA conducts the field work in Northern Ireland. Uh, the first advance letter and an unconditional incentive of £10 then gets sent out about 10 days before the start of the field period and a second advance letter sent out to interviews by interviews locally about um, five days before. Um, and then uh, the start of the data collection uh, starts, which is uh, normally a, a week with an additional one um, to, to follow up on, on any interviews. Um, quick thing to mention, but um, I think you're going to cover this in one of the practice sessions later in terms of uh, how do I identify uh, which questions are asked when. Certain variables are wave specific, others are quarter specific. So in the user guide uh, that contains all the variables or the information about the variables on the data, uh, you have acronym acronyms in the top right corner. Um, so for the first one here, you can see in the green circle, there's an acronym W1F that basically tells you that the question is only asked at wave one or at first contact. The, in the other green circle, you can see a reference to AJ. Um, that basically means that the question is only asked in the quarter April to June. So the second quarter of the year. So this is just uh, to know sort of what sample size you would you would have uh, for the question you want to use in your analysis.
also very quickly to mention that obviously we want to ensure that um, uh, we have uh, good quality data so therefore we have implemented various things to ensure that uh, people understand the questions so we, we obviously use show cards for some of the questions during the pandemics obviously with telephone interviewing not really the case so the questions are being read out more but um, for face-to-face -face interviews that's normally being used and we have also implemented soft checks and hard checks in our questionnaires to make sure where um, there's any oddities in terms in terms or conflicts in uh, answers being given that interviewers can check those and correct as they go along. Um, now, quite quite a few things to mention in terms of what's happened since the start of the pandemic. I've got here a timeline um, that shows you. Sorry, I just click through. Um, shows you the changes that happened um, from the start of 2020. So beginning of March. 2020, the public awareness started affecting survey participation. Um, and as of 17th of March, face-to-face uh, -face data collection was suspended, so we had to switch to telephone interviewing in wave one. Uh, lockdown also then began on the 23rd, which meant that interviews couldn't go out anymore. So we rolled out telephone interviewing to all field interviewers by the end of March. Um, and the problem was also obviously because we are um, uh, sampling from the postcode address file that we didn't have telephone numbers for all of our addresses. Um, so therefore we um, extended the telematching process that we normally just do for addresses north of the Caledonian Canal to the entire sample. And in addition to that, uh, towards the end of April, we also changed our advanced material and set up an online portal to enable uh, participants or um, householders to provide us with their phone contact details via an online portal. Um, and that as well as the telematching provided us with phone contact details for about uh, half the sample. Obviously, that then minimised our achieved sample quite considerably. For that reason, we doubled our wave one sample size to make up for that. Um, and uh, we then trialled um, a, a field strategy uh, called Knock to Natch late in the year um, on some other surveys first before rolling it out um, in April 2021 on the LFS, which was called Knock to Natch, where interviewers basically uh, were able to go out again, knocking on doors, not to do face to face interviews, but to follow up on respondents where we didn't have phone contact details um, uh, to obtain phone numbers. Um, here, this slide basically shows you what happens with our response rates um, when the pandemic started. So you can see in March 2020, it hit rock bottom really from um, mid 20s to around, uh, sorry, from mid 50s to around mid 20s. Um, and it stayed around that level um, until um, we introduced Noctonach in April uh, 2021, where we saw a 10 percentage point increase. That leveled then for a while at around uh, 37%. It saw a bit of uh, our response rate saw a bit of a decrease um, end of last year, but that was not down to Noctonach losing its effectiveness. That was more down to resources being stretched as well as Omicron affecting interviews going out to do Noctonach again. This here shows you the achieved sample size. Um, basically also dropping obviously with the start of the pandemic and when we doubled our sample size with July 2020, we were actually um, then achieving a sample that was above pre-pandemic level. So we tweaked this uh, later in the year again. So we adjust around the, the level that we had um, before the pandemic. Um, what happened though with the start of the pandemic due to the mode switch? we could see that there was a certain types of respondents that we didn't see in the sample anymore. So there was a certain level of uh, response bias introduced. So the turquoise bars on the left basically show you the proportion or the distribution of tenure uh, for owner occupiers, mortgage uh, owners with mortgage and renters before the pandemic. Then the Set the green bar shows you what happened when we switched to telephone mode. So you can see that we then had more owner occupiers and fewer renters in the sample. Um, and then when we introduced Noctonach, which is the uh, purple bar, you can see that the uh, distribution was going in the right direction, basically bringing more of the harder to reach people back into the sample. And the right dark green bar shows you 
uh, the proportion of uh, cases that were subjected to knock to nudge. Um, so they're pretty much where we were before the pandemic. So the the, the use of a knock to nudge strategy in the field was a good thing for us as it as it improved the quality of the sample again. Um, and obviously tenure is something where we normally don't see any any movements or very rarely see movements in the data so because of this re response bias we had um we introduced um a tenure adjustment to um in the calibration of our weights um there is some information on our, our website so i've got a link on the slides later on uh, where you can find a bit more information on that so here is just a few slides that basically show you how our employment rate uh, unemployment rate and uh, the economic inactivity rate changed by this um um, tenure adjustment. So you can see here that um, all three rates saw um, a movement there after this was applied. We obviously also with um, uh, individual characteristics saw some differences uh, in the sample. So we got more older and fewer younger respondents uh, in the sample. And again with Nocturnetch this was improved. Similarly when looking at nationality we saw that we got more UK and fewer non-UK born um, in the sample and that was quite a, an important characteristic that we also needed to address in our weights um, and due to the lack of population estimates covering the year 2020 um, our methodologist had to look at alternative ways of adjusting um, uh, population movements in our weights so um, we wanted to estimate year on year population growth in each re, um, rolling quarter in 2020 onwards and the um, real time information uh, tax data from the HMRC was the best available data really to help us estimate um, these movements. Although obviously that's um, just based on, on employees, it was the best sort of um, available data at the time. The assumptions were that the change in population growth rates of the non-UK subpopulation is the same direction as the change uh, in their RTI employee growth rate and that the magnitude of change in the population growth that does not exceed that of change in the RTI employee growth rate. And here on this slide you can see what um, the labour force um, survey data was before the RTI adjustments on in the middle columns and you can see that the UK um, born um, saw quite big increases whereas the non-UK born vice versa saw very big decreases. So when then the RTI based method was applied we saw much more reasonable changes uh, in the population over the course of 2020. Uh, and again, there's some links in the slides um, where you can follow up and read up more on, on this uh, method. And also, if you are uh, happen to um, attend the conference, uh, the user conference tomorrow, there'll be a presentation about that where a bit more detail is provided. We also updated our questionnaire over the course of the pandemic, uh, where we touched upon a, a few um, uh, topics where uh, follow-up questions were added uh, to help measure when, for example, people have been on sick leave or they were more away from work, worked fewer hours, more hours than usual, etc. That basically these follow-up questions were identifying whether that was down to COVID or the pandemic um, to basically see where there is a movement in the time series, um, whether that was down to the pandemic or potentially to other reasons. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was basically all the changes um, due to the pandemic and uh, looking ahead what's ahead of us. Um, we finished a reweighting exercise in 2021. There will be another one uh, over the course of this year where we basically update our weight adjustment in comparison with uh, um, the latest RTI data. And here's the, the link to the methods paper where you can, when, the, when you have uh, access to the slides, you can follow up on that. Um, 
the office is currently also working on a roadmap back to uh, in-house and face-to-face -face interviewing. Um, we did a small scale trial uh, end of last year and the larger scale trial is, is planned for spring 2020. That won't be on the LFS though, so we want to see first sort of how this impacts on response rates before we, we look at when and how to deploy that again on the, on the LFS. There's also ongoing development uh, alongside um, the, the LFS on the labour market survey. The labour market survey together with a combination of admin data will eventually replace the labour force survey. Um, this is an online first mixed mode data collection. And the latest results from the 2019 mixed mode test are also published on the website, which you've got on the next slide. A few links to follow up for more information if you like. And um, again, if you attend to a conference tomorrow, then um, there's a bit more information on where we are with that provided as well. And that is the end of my presentation. So I can take some questions now if we have time before we go to the next slide, uh, to, the, sorry, to the next session. OK, so um, I'm Simon Woods, but I work as um, as the introduction said earlier, I work with um, Martina on the Labour Force Survey and the annual population survey. Uh, so this ses session will basically give a, a very brief kind of overview um, to the different types of LFS and APS data sets that are available through the UK data service and, and the uh, and the SRS. And essentially as well is kind of what to consider when uh, when looking to do uh, analysis using the LFS and an APS, um, essentially what the main purpose of the data sets, uh, some limitations on the data sets as well, and some quite fairly basic do's and don'ts uh, that you should look to follow. Um, and it's probably worth pointing out at this stage that most of the information that I give here will be uh, or is available via the Labour Force Survey uh, User Guide 10, which is available on the website. So if you don't read any of the data, any of the user guides, sorry, that are that are available, I suggest you you read user guide ten. It's quite an informative and short uh, user guides. So can we skip through to the LFS person, Martina, please? Okay. Yeah. Was it the one you wanted? Yep. That's great. Yep. So essentially, the the, the labor um, the the LFS person data sets are probably the the most widely used um, data set that we produce, both from um, an internal and an external uh, point of view, and it's really the main source for the labor market overview statistical bulletin that is published uh, each month. And its main kind of analysis is is or main use for analysis is really to produce uh, person level statistics such as employment, unemployment and, and economic activ inactivity levels, etc., uh, broken down by personal characteristics such as age, sex, ethnicity, etc. These are produced um, on, a, on a kind of a rolling quarterly basis. Uh, so these help publish, as I said, the, the monthly labour market release. Um, externally, we always used to just publish them um, on a calendar quarter basis. But since the pandemic, uh, due to the importance of the Labour Force Survey, we've now started to publish them uh, every month on a temporary basis until we, we kind of deem that, um, I wouldn't say the pandemic is over, but essentially reporting on the pandemic uh, is kind of slowed down a bit. There are essentially kind of two main weights uh, on the LFS person data sets, and that's the LFS person weight and the LFS earnings weight. And apart from if you're analyzing earnings or carrying out earnings analysis, you should always use the LFS person weight when doing any types of analysis. Just a couple of things to be aware of with the LFS person data sets or even the APS person data sets. Person data sets should not be used for any family or, you know, best practice is not to use them for any family or household type analysis. And this is really because the person level data sets do not contain everyone in the everyone that is sampled uh, in the household. Um, they will only contain the people that respond to the survey in that wave. Um, again, as Martina mentioned, the, the LFS 
data sets should only be really used for analysis at the kind of UK and regional level and certainly not below the regional level. And they're also not to be used for kind of any personal well-being or sexual orientation analysis. Um, we've had this in the past where people have picked up, um, I think it was in, in when they were first introduced, uh, they, they were available on LFS person data sets. So again, please don't use them for for uh, any personal well-being or sexual orientation analysis. And this is because they're not asked in every wave of, of the LFS, as, as Martina was pointing out in, in her slides uh, earlier. It's just finally on, on the LFS earnings uh, questions. They, they are also not asked on every wave of the LFS. So they're only asked in waves one and five of the, of the LFS, and that's why um, there is a specific uh, earnings weight to use uh, with those um, with those variables. Next slide, please, Martina. Yep. It's already on the longitudinal one, sorry. Yep, that's okay. So the LFS longitudinal data sets, um, there are two versions of these. Um, there are the two quarter longitudinal data sets and the five quarter longitudinal data sets. But essentially the two quarter longitudinal data sets are the primary source for the labour market's published flow estimates. Um, and really these kind of are helpful to um, analyse those kind of moving in and out of things like employment, unemployment and inactivity from um, from one quarter to the next or over, a, you know, if you're looking at the five quarter data sets over over those five quarters to see how people's um, economic activity um, it behaves, if you like. Um, and as the kind of title suggests, these only contain individuals that have responded for two or five consecutive periods. Uh, these, unlike the LFS person data sets, are only produced on a calendar quarter basis, uh, both internally and externally. And just a couple of quick things to be aware with these data sets, um, especially with the five quarter longitudinal data set, is that the sample sizes can be quite small. So around the, the two quarter um, longitudinal data set uh, is only around 25,000 individuals now and the five quarter is only around 4,000 individuals. So you do need to be careful that your um, sample size is enough for your specific analysis that you're interested in. Uh, and lastly, with these data sets, um, they don't also include every single variable that's available. Um, if you looked at the LFS user guides, uh, they won't contain um, all the LFS variables that are available on the LFS person data sets. And this is um, because they're mainly focused around the labor market requirements for these for these for these flows estimates. So there's only around 500 uh, variables. I say only there's around 500 uh, variables on these data sets compared to well over a thousand on the LFS person data sets, for example. If you can skip to the APS person data sets slide, Martina, please. Yeah. So essentially, um, as Martina pointed out uh, earlier in her slides, the kind of the LFS and APS are quite, you know, intrinsically linked. Um, the APS uh, is made up partly um, from the waves one and five of the of the LFS, and then the boost um, for the APS. But essentially, the APS person data sets provide a much larger sample size, um, especially if you want to carry out analysis below the regional level, so down to local authority, uh, potentially if to, to depending on which variables you're looking to use. But the APS person data sets are really the primary source for labour markets regional level estimates. But they're also used certainly over the last five years or so in in more wider ONS publications. Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. Like the personal well-being uh, publications, the sexual ori orientation publications, and the smoking prevalence publications. So over the last um, so many years, it's become much more um, than just a, what it was originally designed for. An employment-focused survey is much more now like a population-focused uh, survey, and this is really due to the larger sample size that it holds, but also the wide range of other variables that it also covers along with these kind of new variables that we introduced. 
And again, like the LFS person data sets, um, the main purpose is to produce person level statistics uh, broken down by personal characteristics. So again, you should never use the APS person data sets for any family or household uh, analysis because essentially you won't you won't, you might not have everyone in the family or that household on these data sets uh, as I mentioned earlier you'll only have uh, responding individuals there are four data sets published APS person data sets published every year on a rolling annually an annual period so you'll have things like January to December uh, you'll have then they'll move on uh, a quarter and then you'll have the April to March the following year, et cetera. So there are four data sets published every year for people to use. Um, I suppose the biggest challenge sometimes with these data sets is that there are lots of weights on the APS person data sets. So please be very careful, um, especially when you're doing analysis on, on various things, just to make sure you are picking up the correct weights. This, you know, for the large majority of, um, for an, large majority of analysis most people should just use the APS person weight um, but there's things like as I mentioned earlier the the sexual orientation weights uh, the non-proxy weights which is to be used for the for the well-being and the quality of work uh, variables and there's also a fairly new APS earnings weight on the on the January to December data sets as well which has been introduced over the last 18 months or so um, Again, the, the main point of these these data sets is because of the larger sample size, you can do um, analysis below the regional level down to kind of local authority level. Um, but just to be aware that not all variables that are available on LFS person data sets or LFS data sets as a whole will be available on, on APS data sets. And like Ma Martina pointed out just now, and this is largely because they might not be asked in all waves of the LFS, but they're also uh, not asked every quarter on the LFS as well. So just to be aware of that, and that's where you need to kind of reference the user guys to try and uh, make sure you're picking up uh, the correct um, data sets to use. Next slide, please, Martina. Just quickly, this, this is a fairly new kind of product over the last couple of years, the APS uh, two-year longitudinal. So essentially, it's, it has the same kind of methodology and purpose as, as the LFS longitudinal data sets. It's still really classed as a, as a little experimental. So it was originally kind of brought in to replace the, uh, the, the LFS five quarter longitudinal data sets because it's such a, got a, such a small sample size these days. And again, these, this data set contains individuals that have responded uh, for two consecutive years in the APS for January to December periods. But just to make you aware that this isn't yet available via the UKDS, but it is available via the SRS. Next slide, please, Martina. Again, um, this is a, I wouldn't say a fairly new product. It's, it's been available now for a couple of years, um, but essentially this is quite heavily used now and widely used across uh, within ONS and across government. Uh, the APS pool data sets or the three year pool data sets. Uh, again, it's a person level data sets. Um, so you shouldn't be looking at it, carrying out any family or household analysis using this data sets. Um, but essentially, its, it's biggest benefit is that you have a much larger sample size um, compared to the single year APS. Uh, if you ever get access to it, don't think there's going to be three times the size of the single year APS. Um, but it will have around because of the kind of duplication and the, the kind of wave design and the rotational design of the LFS and APS. There will be lots of duplicate cases over through over those three years that we kind of combine together. Um, but you will get a sample size of just under or uh, around 500,000. I think it was 470,000, something like that in the last one we published for uh, 2018 to 2020. And the key thing with these data sets is, is really they should be used just as a point in time estimate. They shouldn't be used really for any time series analysis. And this is because you've essentially, when you've got um, one pool data set compared to the next, essentially two years data from those two data sets are the same consecutive data sets. So essentially all you're doing is kind of comparing uh, 
an APS period three years apart. So it's essentially, as I said, just a, a kind of time uh, point in time estimate uh, to be analysis to use the APS pool data sets. Next slide, please, Martina. So the moving on to the household data sets now. So essentially the LFS and the household, sorry, the LFS and the APS household data sets are really used, uh, main, its main purpose is um, they are used for the labour markets, uh, workless households, statistical bullet, bulletin that's published. Uh, the LFS data sets are used for uh, the UK level workless households and the APS is used for the regional workless households statistical bulletin. Um, and again, both these data sets, the, both the LFS household and the APS household, their main purpose is to try and produce person level statistics, such as employment, as I mentioned, but broken down by characteristics of, of a family and the household in which uh, people live. So that's kind of a key difference um, when you're using, you know, the LFS household data sets, essentially you need to be looking at the different types of families and households in which pe people live as part of your analysis. Um, sometimes people get confused when you mention household data sets. They just think it's, a, you know, uh, it just contains one kind of case per household on the data sets. That isn't true. So these data sets are still at an individual case basis. Um, and they will also have the same people in LFS household data sets as the kind of person data sets. But these household data sets will also include the non responding individuals uh, that I said were missing from the person level data sets. And these non responding individuals um, will be imputed for via the donor method that Martina mentioned uh, earlier. And this, you know, essentially you can do household and family. Um, and level analysis because you now have everyone in the family and household on these data sets. So if you're ever using or if you ever want to do analysis, um, kind of a, a mixture between personal and household level analysis, you should always, as, as if, if you can, use the household level data sets. Uh, next slide, please, Martina. So Essentially, I've just said everything I wanted to say about the household data sets, but again, the APS household data set is only published once a year, so we only publish them for the January to December period, unlike uh, the APS person data sets where you have four year. And and again, these are these are more for kind of below uh, below regional level that we you would use the the APS household data sets. Next slide, please, Martina. So Martina mentioned the kind of, you know, obviously what, why we create weights on the uh, on the LFS and APS. Obviously the LFS APS is just a sample. Um, so we need to somehow kind of estimate that for the people that we uh, we don't interview. So the methods for the weighting for pretty much all the data sets is, is broadly similar. Uh, in that historically you're always used uh, a range of characteristic variables in the weighting calibrations, things like age, sex, uh, and, and a range of geographies. But of course, as Martina said, that since the pand pandemic, we've also added in things like a tenure constraint and a country of birth constraint. And we've also introduced a, a kind of a non-response adjustment as well to try and tackle the issues that we've come across uh, that Martina was mentioning around the data collection as well. And the key thing, I suppose, to take away from this um, from this session, especially with the weights, is that please make sure that any time you've kind of looking at data sets to make sure you're using the correct weight. Um, and obviously this is because the, the different weights will filter the target population that you're trying to you know, create analysis for. So, um, you know, so things like sexual orientation, well-being and income or earnings weights. Um, if you know, if you use those incorrectly, um, you will have um, obviously incorrect target population totals. And the reason for that is because they're not asked to everyone, you know, things like sex ID, uh, the well-being variables, earnings variables that they're not asked to everyone uh, 
in in the in the kind of household, if you like. So, for example, the well-being questions you can't answer those by proxy. You have to actually um, just ask the respondent themselves. Next slide, Martina, please. So, Martina mentioned things about the variables earlier. Again, I won't go over it too much, but essentially there are there are well over a thousand variables available on most data sets, uh, LFS and APS on person and household data sets. Um, again, these are these are a range of questionnaire variables, quest, um, variables that we derive ourselves from what we've already collected to try and reduce the questionnaire length. They also include a range of uh, geography variables uh, to help people kind of do um, different types of um, of geography uh, regions, etc. Um, just to be aware that not all, as I as I mentioned earlier, not all variables will be on every single data set. So please reference the the user guides to kind of give you an indication. Um, we have so many questions, not only really coming from externals, but even internals, where uh, people have asked for certain questions um, and finally say why they're missing. And if, if we looked at the user guides, we could see straight away that they're not asked in the LFS um, certain quarters or you know certain waves, etc. So please reference the user guides uh, just to make sure that you know the, the questions that you're interested in are in these various data sets. Just to be aware that there are what's called missing values on 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 data sets for each for each variable. So um, a minus nine on a on a data set will mean that that, that question uh, individuals weren't rooted to that question, so so it hasn't been asked to that individual. And then a minus eight is means that it, they were asked, but they either uh, replied they don't know or refused to answer that specific question. Um, the UKDS or so the end user license will include a, a kind of a cut down and reduced set of variables compared to um, the more extended version, which is available through the uh, the SRS. And the UKDS doesn't have really any actual personal identifiers. Um, they're kind of more randomized. Um, but essentially, bit, all this is trying to do is uh, from from the UKDS version is to try and protect uh, responders from any identification. So that's the critical thing with the end user license, obviously. Um, just to add that on the final point on on variables is that, as Martina said, that we introduced a whole range of COVID variables um, in the questionnaire back last April. Um, so initially we did withhold those from any UK, any data sets published on the UKDS and S and and SRS, but these have now uh, since been published in, in recent months, so they are available. Next slide, please, Martina. It's, it's already on data pooling. On, the, on data pooling. Um, so as a general rule of thumb, we don't, you know, we, we because we publish the APS pool data set, et cetera, we don't kind of advise anyone trying to pool data sets together to kind of get a larger sample size. Um, and because uh, th this is really because we've come across people um, getting into real trouble because of the complexity of the, the survey design and not understanding that. And this is because obviously because of the wave structure, you get lots of duplicate cases from one quarter to the next or one year to the next. But essentially as well, the critical thing is you don't you won't have an appropriate weight to use um, if, if you're if you're trying to pool uh, data sets together yourself. And that's all I wanted to say on that slide, Martina. Thank you. So this is, you know, there is a flow chart in the back of user guide 10, which I kind of alluded to earlier, which um, which is probably a very helpful user guide if you're a new starter to the LFS and APS. And as I said, there's a flow chart at the back which kind of directs you through this kind of slide. So it it helps you, it kind of asks you questions to try and pinpoint which data set and which weight you should be using um, for the different types of analysis that are available. So I won't talk through this slide, but essentially you can kind of feed down uh, and ask yourself this question, uh, all these questions, and then the flow chart, uh, flow chart will should help you. Next slide, please, Martina. 
And again, I think it's the, the main thing to take away from is uh, the, all this information. There's loads of information out there on the on our user guide web page. I know there are lots of <laughs> there are endless user guides um, for people to kind of read, so it, it can be quite daunting. But essentially, um, all the different user guides that are available are listed on the screen. Some are extremely long, like a user guide one, which goes into extreme depth about the LFS methodology. Um, then there are kind of more useful and probably useful user guides, things like user guide two. Uh, three and four, which contains the information that's asked in the questionnaire and the flow charts for things like derived variables, how we kind of create those derived variables. Um, but there's a whole range of different types of user guides there, depending on what which analysis you'd like to do. But essentially, the critical things is, um, you know, use the correct data set, use the correct weight, and obviously make sure that the variables you're using uh, what you think they are and that they're available for all the periods you're expecting them to be available for. I think that's it from me. Yep.